Hi, everybody. Earlier this week was Equal Pay Day. It marks the extra time the average woman has to work into a new year to earn what a man earned the year before. You see, the average woman who works full-time in America earns less than a man, even when she's in the same profession and has the same education. That's wrong. In 2014, it's an embarrassment. Women deserve equal pay for equal work. This is an economic issue that affects all of us. Women make up about half of our workforce, and more and more, they're our family's main breadwinners. So it's good for everyone when women are paid fairly. That's why this week I took action to prohibit more businesses from punishing workers who discuss their salaries, because more pay transparency makes it easier to spot pay discrimination. And I hope more business leaders will take up this cause. But equal pay is just one part of an economic agenda for women. Most lower wage workers in America are women. So I've taken executive action to require federal contractors to pay their federally funded employees at least $10.10 an hour. I ordered a review of our nation's overtime rules to give more workers the chance to earn the overtime pay that they deserve. And thanks to the Affordable Care Act, tens of millions of women are now guaranteed free preventive care, like mammograms and contraceptive care. And the days when you could be charged more just for being a woman are over for good. Across the country, we're bringing Americans together to help us make sure that a woman can have a baby without sacrificing her job, or take a day off to care for a sick child or parent without hitting hardship. It's time to do away with workplace policies that belong in a Mad Men episode and give every woman the opportunity she deserves. Here's the problem, though. On issues that would benefit millions of women, Republicans in Congress have blocked progress at every turn. Just this week, Senate Republicans blocked the Paycheck Fairness Act, common sense legislation that would help more women win equal pay for equal work. House Republicans won't vote to raise the minimum wage or extend unemployment insurance for women out of work through no fault of their own. The budget they passed this week would force deep cuts to investments that overwhelmingly benefit women and children, like Medicaid, food stamps, and college grants. And of course, they're trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act for the 50th or so time, which would take away vital benefits and protections for millions of women. I'm going to keep fighting to make sure that doesn't happen, because we do better when our economy grows for everybody, not just a few. And when women succeed, America succeeds. On April 12, 2014, President Obama addressed the nation and underscored the importance of ensuring equal pay for equal work and highlighted the steps his administration has taken to expand opportunity and narrow the pay gap that exists between men and women, including the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. At the same time, on Equal Pay Day, the President took action to increase transparency and make it easier to recognize pay discrimination. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2012, women who worked full-time earned on an average only 77 cents for every dollar that men earned. The figures are even worse for women of color. African-American women earned only approximately 64 cents and Latinas only 54 cents for each dollar earned by a white male. In Congress, pending legislation entitled the Paycheck Fairness Act, sponsored by Senator Barbara Mikulski, intends to make it illegal for employers to retaliate against a worker who inquires about or discloses her or his wages or the wages of another employee in a complaint or investigation. It would also make employers liable to civil actions. As a part of this bill, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission would be required to collect pay information from employers. The bill would update the Equal Pay Act of 1963, a law that has not been able to achieve its promise of closing the wage gap because of limited enforcement tools and inadequate remedies. The Paycheck Fairness Act would make critical changes to the law. The time has come to make equal pay a reality. During this climate of unprecedented economic uncertainty, nothing could be more important than ensuring that all workers receive equal pay for equal work. In this insider-exclusive Investigative Network TV special, our news team goes behind the headlines in Equal Pay for Equal Work, Dr. Michelle Taylor's story. To examine how LaShawn Williams, principal at the L.A. Williams Law Firm, is representing Dr. Michelle Taylor, 
Assistant Dean of the Graduate School at Texas Southern University for equal pay for equal work. For Dr. Michelle Taylor, the time came when she could no longer accept being not only underpaid, but compensated far less than her male counterparts. After almost 33 years of services at Texas Southern University, Dr. Taylor is approaching a time when she must seriously consider retirement. Such a consideration brought to mind her dedicated service to the university and its students at a pay rate she had to continually fight to receive, although unequal. Year after year, Dr. Taylor fought for raises in compensation which would bring her to the compensation guidelines touted in the university's compensation plan. And still to date, Dr. Taylor earns just over the minimum salary for a newly hired dean. Her male counterparts earn $20,000 to $30,000 more a year. When women succeed, our families succeed and America succeeds. President Obama believes that ensuring that women earn equal pay for equal work is essential to improving the economic security of all families and the growth of our middle class and our economy. Women compose nearly half of the American workforce. Since day one, President Obama has been laser focused on ensuring women have the fundamental rights they deserve when it comes to earning a fair and equal wage. The first piece of legislation that the president signed into law after taking office was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which empowers women to recover wages lost to discrimination by extending the time period in which an employee can file a claim. Yet a central challenge that remains to enforcing equal pay laws is that many women do not even know that they're underpaid, and therefore they can't take steps to ensure equal pay for equal work. Dr. Taylor's main challenge is identifying men similarly situated or in an identical position as her. The law requires that Dr. Taylor show that men similarly situated to her earn more money. Advocates for pay equity say that a major challenge to enforcing equal pay laws is secrecy about what people are paid. Some employers maintain policies that punish workers who voluntarily share salary information with coworkers. That's according to the National Women's Law Center. While Texas Southern University's conduct is not unique because several universities in Texas and across the nation have been accused of unequal pay, this is yet another negative circumstance for Texas Southern University, a historically black institution which has received substantial bad media press over the years. This case, represented on a national level, could have serious implications for the college. LaShawn has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Houston, in Texas, and in the United States. Her goals, not only to get justice for her clients, but to make sure that everyone is treated with equal respect and dignity as guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. She has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. Her amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide her clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Houston, Texas. It is my great pleasure to introduce LaShawn Williams to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tell our audience a little bit about your firm. What kind of law do you practice primarily? The majority of law that we practice is employment discrimination law. Um, my background was in corporate America, representing defendant, the defense firms and corporations. And the enemy. Well, now, definitely. <laughs> Back then they weren't, but it's another story now. And so uh, we do discrimination, gender-based discrimination, race-based, um, ethnicity, um, all the protected class statuses under Title VII. Yeah. Today we are talking about one of those folks that your heart is behind and you're fighting for. Absolutely. And it's Dr. Michelle Taylor. Yes. Tell our audience a little bit about who Dr. Taylor is, where she works, and what's the problem. Small stature woman, little woman, powerhouse, strong, very intelligent. She is an assistant dean at Texas Southern University. 
earned her PhD back in 2000, um, committed there, started out in the library, been there 33 years at Texas Southern University. Um, the majority of those years, 30 plus in the graduate studies program. So she has held the hands of hundreds of students as they matriculated and came out of their master's program mm -hmm. and their PhD programs. So that's what she does at, um, at that institution. And um, She's an assistant dean, right? Assistant okay. dean. And, um, and, and in that position, you know, she reports to the dean of the graduate school and also the president of the university. Um, but she's the, the heart and soul of the school's graduate program. And this university is known especially for what? Texas Southern University is what we call an HBCU, historically black institution. Mm -hmm. um, I also went to law school there, mm -hmm. and so I, I love that it's the school, um, the person who actually allowed us to be able to have the law school there, his last name was Sweat, in a big case um, where, you know, he couldn't get into law school at Austin, UT. And so after much litigation and, and other things, Texas Southern started its law school program. Um, and then Texas Southern itself is, is, is a state school, um, but again, it's a historically black school birthed out of that, you know, you can have your own. Um, we'll give you equal but separate. Yeah. Um, but of course now, all these years later, it's integrated. Um, all walks of life, everyone is there, um, representative. And so, um, you know, it's, it's odd that we have this kind of a case. Yeah, it's, uh, it's ironic actually because here you have a school that's dedicated to equal opportunity, yes. correct? Yes. Although when it was established equal but separate, right? Yes. And now within the university, within its own walls, we, within its own you know, hierarchy, we have this case which is about equal pay for equal work. So tell our audience a little bit about Dr. Michelle Taylor's plight. When she started, uh, she replaced a, a male in uh, the graduate school. She came in and replaced him at lesser pay for equal work. And that's where her fight started from the very beginning when she replaced this other um, uh, support staff in the graduate school. Um, and in 2007, after many complaints, um, they increased her pay, mm -hmm. um, but not to the level of equating it with um, her male counterparts, other assistant deans. Yeah. And so the fight has been, again, as you stated, um, equal pay for equal work. Yeah. Um, there are uh, several other male assistant deans, um, but the tendency is to um, distinguish her from them, and she doesn't have the ammunition to actually show that there is no distinction because it's her employer who holds that information, who holds those critical facts. But here we are in 2014 still fighting for the same thing. There is legislation on the books right now. That's right. There are laws on the books right now that says if, this is the big catch-all, right? Mm -hmm. If you can prove that your male counterpart is getting paid more money, you should be paid the same thing. Right. Or if that continues, that disparity, then it is against the law and you can sue for this reason. That's right. Um, what's the problem in getting that information? Well, the employer holds it. Yeah, and they're not giving it up, are they? Oh, no. And actually, if you talk about your salary, and, and most in, people who work know this, you're not supposed to talk about your salary. Yeah. Nobody's supposed reason. to know. Right. For that reason. Right. So you would think that a university that prides itself on equal opportunity would be the first in, to be a leader in making sure that everybody is treated equally and it, paid equally. It should be fundamentally a part. <laughs> this is our educational yeah. system. So this case is pending right now. Absolutely, in federal court. Where are you in lit lit litigation right now? Well, we are in the midst of finishing up what we call discovery. We've yeah. done depositions. We have a couple more depositions to do. Um, and then we'll move into what's called the motions where they seek to get our key case kicked out. Yeah. Um, on that challenge that you just brought up a second yeah. ago, proving they'll say that she doesn't do equal work. Yeah. And, you know, we can't prove that she does equal work. In fact, this show is an informative show. It's going to show a real-life case, but more importantly, it is to direct women 
yes. who are in the workplace yes. to get out there and make themselves known that they want to be treated equally and paid the same amount of money right. as their male counterpart. And unless they do so, this is not going to happen, correct? Right. They have all, we all have to get together on this. It's a call of duty for women. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Call of duty, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. Today we are lucky enough to have with us Dr. Michelle Taylor, so let's bring her on right now. Sure. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Taylor. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks for being here, really. Appreciate you having me. We came all the way down here to Houston because this is an important issue, you know, equal pay for equal work. Tell our audience a little bit about your personal story, about how you started. What was your initial job at the university? Administrative assistant to yeah. the dean of the graduate school. Yeah, and this has been 33 years. Uh, and in those 33 years, you have struggled to get equal pay for the same job that m your male counterparts are getting paid. Tell us that experience. It's been very uh, demeaning. Uh, it's been kind of heartbreaking because I give my all when I'm at work and uh, I do everything that I can to help others so that their job will be easier to do and help you know our students to get through whatever they're working on. Mm -hmm. I've been responsible for the times that I've been there. I've dealt with uh, over 3,000 students who have graduated and over I don't know how many files that I have to work with students who are trying to graduate and may not have made it at this particular time so they're waiting right. to get out another time. But I uh, work with all graduate students that come through the graduate school at the master's level and the doctorate level. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first started, I did replace a gentleman. And uh, I always worked for mostly a male dean. I had one female dean for about a year when we had some transition. But the first dean that I worked for, I worked for him for almost 20 years. and. Um, from day one, he hired me, and of course, I was young and you know eager to get my professional life what started. The yeah, and I you know didn't realize that I did replace a male. I knew I did, but I never thought to go back and check that what I was being paid was less than what he had been paid. You know, we hear these figures like women are paid on the average of about 77 cents for every dollar that a male is paid for the same job. Are those ratios pretty much the same with you and the person that you replaced? I believe it might have been back in those days. It might have been more. Yeah. In the sense. So you went, you went to your boss. I went to my new my boss from when I first started yeah. on more than one occasion. And you I said, would how always, come? Yeah, I would ask him. You know, I'm doing my work, and you know, whenever you assign me to assist someone else or give me an added you know, assignment to do that someone else would get paid a supplement or extra pay for, you don't feel that you should give me any increase in my salary. So I struggled with him for 20 years back and forth with that. When and you, and, and let me stop you here for a minute. You struggled with him for 20 years. Was there documentation where you made requests? Because you're, you're walking a fine line. If you become a pain in the you know where, you worried you might get fired for whatever reason, right? So what exactly would he say to you about, we'll look into it, were those words like that, we'll look into it? Not quite, we'll look into it, but uh, the budget just does not have uh, room to handle anything. We're doing you know, the best that we can, my doing what we can do. My immediate response would be, if, I, if somebody was being paid 50000 and I got 30000 I said, well, you know, I, I solved that problem for you. $20,000 difference, that guy takes a $10,000 cut and you give me 10000 mm -hmm. then there's no budget problems, is there? <laughs> right, right. I mean, seriously. Right. And I'm sure you made that suggestion. And, of course, but uh, in the environment that we're in, uh, yeah. that's not how budgets are yeah. allocated. Uh, this is all they've given our department. This is what we have to work with. Yeah. Uh, I can go and ask, but I'm sure we're not going to get any different response. Yeah. Now... I, I talked to you before the show, and I want to point out to our audience that you have never sued anybody in your lifetime, have you? No, I have you not. You look to solve problems internally. 
but after 33 years, you know, you can't get the kind of justice you could in a, in a courtroom maybe, correct? That's what I'm finding. And that's why you've retained LaShawn here to fight that battle for you in the courtroom. Exactly. She has uh, given me much more confidence yeah. in what I'm fighting for. Uh, I knew when I came to her that I was fighting for something that was right. Yeah. And now that I've been working with her this period of time, I find that I'm not just doing it for me, but I'm doing it for the people and females mostly who I encounter. Yeah. They don't have the courage to yeah. take a stand because they have those other personal issues that won't allow them to stand out yeah. because they know that they have that head on the chopping block kind of yeah. environment. So they, they, they're just afraid to, you know, say that they're being mistreated, they're not being treated right. fairly. Um, we're on national TV right now. You want to say anything to Texas Southern University or any of the other corporations out there, make a statement, if you will. I do appreciate Texas Southern for being able to develop me in my professional career. Mm -hmm. I just wish that they would show me back the same appreciation by you know, allowing me to be compensated for my worth. I, yes. I think I have been a very, very valuable employee and uh, instrumental in a lot of ways at the university. Yeah. And I think that the only thing they can do to really, really make things right is to compensate me at the level that I should be paid. Which you should be paid, equal pay, equal work, right? Exactly. I want to thank you very much for being on this show and we wish you much success. We're going to have a couple of your colleagues on, uh, Professor uh, Edith Wu, correct? And Associate Dean Faith Joseph Jackson. So let's bring them on right now. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Edith Wu and Associate Dean Faith Jackson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, let's talk specifically about something because both of you are lawyers. And as you told us in the beginning, Faith, that you don't have to rehearse for this. You already know it. you've been living it, right? Right, that's correct. Do you have evidence that shows that a male counterpart in the same job as you is being paid more money than each one of you? Yes, we do. And have you taken that, because you haven't filed any lawsuits yet, right? Yeah. Have you taken that information? When you take it, obviously you have. But when you take it to the administration, what do they say to you when you're saying, I'm a law professor, I'm a lawyer, I know the law, here's the proof, what are you going to do about it? Well, I talked to a top administrator, yeah. and he basically told me that I, woo, you want us to pay you what you think you ought to be paid. So when he translated what you told him, and he clearly understood it, what was the follow-up? He understood it, but he was basically saying, I'm going to, I'm not going to pay you. You're not going to get what you, what you get because I asked for an audit to see. I've also done a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act, to see what the salaries are. Yeah. And it's a clear, it's clear that the men make more. And they always have a reason. Well, this guy's been here for 25 years and this guy's been here longer and this guy's doing whatever. We're doing the same job. Yeah and there should be an audit. So in other words, they're saying to you they're doing different jobs. Is that well, right, Faye? Uh, what it is, I, I think, it, we're not liking a rules or process or whatever at the school. Well, we are like, liking a process. We have a rule, there's no problems with rules, yeah. but it's the protocol and process that's required for men and the protocol and process that's required for women. My case, it's not salary directly, but it is indirectly. I went up for a promotion uh, about two years ago, or two years ago, and as uh, Dr. Wu stated, we are evaluated on three, three things, um, teaching, uh, uh, scholarship, and service. And I met all three of the areas. And uh, one of the things we have is faculty governance, and I got the support of the faculty. But then at the very end, my promotion was not supported by my supervisor. Well, the end of this is going to impact your salary. It's going to impact your retirement later. Sure. It's going to have a snowball effect. 
One of the things I think we shared with you earlier is that we both teach contracts, which is a first year required course. Uh, and I thought about this over the weekend because it was Mother's Day. And I'm at the age now that I'm old enough to be the mothers of many of my students. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always tell them is that, listen, you have to be the advocate for the person who doesn't have the voice later on. You have to fight. No one's going to fight for you like you fight for yourself. So it's very difficult to, to really go ahead after you give the black law letter theory and talk to them and then go to your office. Yeah and just sit down and kowtow and just say, you know what, I can tell all those good things to my students, but I really can't do that for myself. Um, you, with all this evidence, all this proof, a, is a, there's a clear violation of the law. Right. You have filed a complaint with the EEOC, correct? That's correct. And you are awaiting what? Uh, right now, they are behind as far as their docket. But it's, to me, I think it's a good sign because with the EOC, one of the things you want to do after you file, they let you know, okay, go ahead and they'll give you what's called your letter to sue. Yeah. I have not received that yet. And, and typically, how long does that take? About a year, doesn't it? It depends on the, yeah. on the, on the investigator. Yeah. But the one thing I want to interject about Dean Jackson's situation is that um, the university, the, when you file the EEOC complaint, yeah. the EEOC sends you information and they ask you if you are willing to mediate. The university said no. They said no. So that's all of the good old boys sticking together, yeah. and they've decided. Because I had to file an EEOC complaint against them years ago, you did. and they agreed to mediate, and I was able to resolve the issue. But here, so in the, the same that. issue, equal pay for equal work. No, it was it was a, a similar situation where it was um, I had received raises yes. on an administrative because I used to be an associate dean yeah. and they did not want me to keep the raises that went to the person. So I had to file EEOC and I was able to work with the university to, to straighten that out. But when they want to play hardball with you, which is the situation with her, they say no. But they know clearly the dean in her situation violated process because he implemented rules that were not part of our faculty governance. Right. They, he used the rule in November. We changed the rule in that May, that May at the last meeting. Which is only going to be applied to those who are hired after. Right. However, it's not it retroactive. Was, right. But it was applied to me. Yeah. And the administration, if the dean is here, the provost will validate the dean, which is, a male. And, which is a male, and then the president, which is a male as well, he only can make a, as a decision based on what his provost says. So you have a dean that acted ultra vires. Yeah. You have a provost that now validates the dean. It goes to the president, and of course the president is going to say yes, even though the processes have not been followed. And this is why we're doing this show. And I want to thank you very much for both being on this show. We could talk for hours. We could. Thank and you. And I would love to do it sometime in the future. You must get a lot of calls. And after this show, you'll probably get a lot more calls about people who think they've been women who have been treated unfairly. How do you select your clients and their cases? Well, I don't know if I can put a word to it. Um, but it's really about when they come and they tell me their story and I look them in the eyes and I have to see beyond the words that they're using because you know I don't I don't advertise you're right they call me they come to me and so I listen to their story and more so what's behind the words their heart and I always get a pull I, I get a little ding you know and I know, okay, this is one that we have to take even when the money isn't there or the yeah. facts don't look pretty or, yeah. you know, you know you're going to go up against a big institution. I just, I look to the heart of my client. That's the simplest way I can, I can put it. Well, you have that gut feeling, don't you? That's it. It's right. a gut feeling. Well, keep on doing what you're doing because you're doing a good job. And we're glad we had the opportunity of having you on our show. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.